Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Heather Brown. I am the Director of Grant Writing and Publications at the University of Missouri Columbia. I am pleased to welcome you to the fourth annual Federal Research Update webinar. This event is sponsored by the University of Missouri Columbia, the National Association of College and University Business Officers, and the Florida High Tech Corridor Council, an economic development initiative of the State University System of Florida. Before we again begin, just uh, want you to know we're sending our thoughts out to all those who are affected by Hurricane Sandy um, and we hope that you are safe and that you and yours are also safe in riding out this storm. We're so pleased that all of you could join us this morning. We know that it's early for our friends on the West Coast so um, just want you to know that we are taping uh, this webinar and it will be up on our website and you can access it at any time um, once the broadcast has been edited and posted and we will send you a notice when that happens. Um, today during our, our broadcast if you have any technology issues or questions or problems please send an email to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Each of our presenters will be answering questions at the end of their presentation so if you have a question you would like addressed please send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Finally, we have viewers joining us from across the country. As a result, we will be using, instead of specific times, phrases such as top of the hour and bottom of the hour to indicate when our next speaker will be beginning. So let's get started. I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, Kay Kozumi. Kay is Assistant Director for Federal Research and Development at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Before joining, joining OSTP, Kay served as the longtime director of the R&D Budget and Policy Program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is known as a leading authority on federal science and technology funding and budget issues and is a frequent speaker to public groups and to the press. Let's turn it over to Kay. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning uh, in the aftermath of the hurricane. Uh, we are uh, under recovery here in Washington, D.C. It's a pleasure for me to talk to you today about uh, funding for research and development from federal agencies. So I'm going to lead off and of course uh, you'll be hearing from my agency colleagues later on as we talk through some of the proposals that are on the table for federal support of research and development and for STEM education over the coming year. So today we'll be talking a lot about the 2013 budget and President Obama's proposals for how, how the federal government intends to support the U.S. science and engineering and education enterprise. Uh, so uh, we will lead right off with kind of the vision statement that President Obama put forward uh, a year ago. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, a vision for an economy that's built to last. So in a State of the Union address, uh, in January, President Obama uh, articulated some themes for this the coming budget season and for the federal government's investments in 2013. Specifically, uh, American manufacturing, American energy, skills for American workers, and renewal of American values. Now, for the U.S. science and engineering enterprise, certainly the uh, the first three are our key guiding posts for the, the the budget that we put together and proposed to the congress back in february in addition uh... president obama outlined uh... how innovation specifically in innovation based on science and research fits in with uh... the proposals for uh... twenty thirteen and as you can see uh... with this innovation economy that america is in uh, and global competition to be a leader in the innovation economy for the world, uh, America really needs to step up and continue its world-class commitment to science and research. So these are the principles in the State of the Union Address and also in President Obama's words from last December that guide us in formulating this 2013 budget that we'll be talking a lot about today. And so in February of this year, President Obama uh, released his proposed budget for 2013. Uh, and that essentially sums up into investing in our future, that despite some very tough economic conditions and a need to reduce uh, projected deficits in the future, 
there are some investments that only the federal government can make and that needs to make in order to ensure the, uh, American prosperity for the future. So these are the, the large themes that guide uh, the 2013 budget. As you can see, uh, the budget is about prioritizing investments that push the frontiers of scientific discovery. Obviously, that is work that you in your universities is, are very much engaged in. Uh, in addition, of course, these investments are designed to spur innovation, uh, and in particular, innovation in a couple of areas that are consistent with the State of the Union address. That is, creating new American jobs in manufacturing, promoting clean American energy, educating our students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subjects, and building a 21st century <laughs> infrastructure, because we realize that scientific discovery manufacturing, energy, STEM education, and infrastructure are all necessary for the United States to remain competitive in the global economy. And this federal budget does fit in with this context of making some very tough choices because uh, all increases in programs are offset by cuts in other programs. That, of course, is designed to get our, our federal budget on a more sustainable path and to reduce our long-term borrowing needs on a smooth path over the next few years. So this budget does keep non-security discretionary spending flat for the second year in a row. Um, so every, cut, every increase in a program is offset with a cut in another program. Now let me take a moment here to describe some of the, the budget situation that we face in October 2012. It has been a long while since the President presented his proposed 2013 budget in February. Um, and of course for the federal government, uh, fiscal year 2013 began on October 1st. So, we are, so for us, 2013 is already here. Uh, but the federal budget situation is unresolved. It's unresolved for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is that in August of last year, in 2011, U.S. lawmakers did agree on a debt limit increase uh, accompanied by a comprehensive deficit reduction framework. And we're going to be you know, talking a lot about this framework. It's called the Budget and Control Act. Now that Budget Control Act that the President signed last August does contain a number of procedures that are starting to, well, the, the deadlines are starting to, to bite for the federal government. One deadline that it created was that um, by January of this coming year, January 2nd of 2013, uh, a committee of Congress, the so-called Super Committee, was charged with agreeing on a deficit reduction package that would re reduce deficits by $1.5 trillion over the next decade. Uh, and this super committee had a deadline of last fall to come up with legislation that would accomplish that. Uh, the, the super committee did not reach an agreement on that. Uh, and so, because the committee did not reach agreement on a deficit reduction legislation, the next phase of the Budget Control Act then kicked in. And that uh, next phase takes place on January 2nd of 2013. And the next phase is when uh, sequestration happens. We'll be hearing a lot about sequestration, particularly later on in the day. And, uh, well, simply, uh, if sequestration does happen in January, that would mean an immediate 8 to 11 percent cut in nearly all federal government programs that would take effect. Uh, and it would uh, not only be a, an 8 to 11 percent cut for 2013, but similar cuts for future years going on for a decade. Now that is, of course, a very bad outcome, and it's something that uh, Congress and the President will be trying to resolve over the, the next few months. Um, the, we are confident, and the administration has uh, indicated its uh, proposals for how to avoid sequestration. Uh, because sequestration happens in January 2013, that means that Congress still has the, uh, the option, and we think the obligation to, uh, to come up with deficit reduction legislation that would be sufficient to avoid sequestration. And so to help that process along, the President on two separate occasions, last September and also this February, has presented uh, a menu of proposals for how to accomplish deficit reduction. Uh, those deficit reduction proposals are uh, in excess of $3 trillion over the next decade. So we are confident that you know, Congress can choose from this menu of deficit reduction options and still get to uh, a deficit reduction that would be sufficient to avoid sequestration. 
Now we are we recognize, of course, that there are some conflicting approaches and conflicting philosophies about how to reduce federal budget deficits. So the president has indicated all along that uh, he is prepared to sign a balanced deficit reduction approach, uh, an approach that takes a look at spending cuts for discretionary and mandatory programs, but also some revenue increases. Uh, and he uh, and the administration will be looking to work with Congress over the next few weeks to get to a balanced approach to deficit reduction. Uh, so after the elections, Congress will be coming back uh, for a session, and uh, we anticipate that they will be working on this deficit reduction legislation at this time. And uh, you know, we remain confident that there will be an agreement reached in time for January. Uh, also in this, the picture, of course, is that uh, a number of tax cuts are, are scheduled to expire at the end of December. So the current payroll tax cut and also the 2001 and 2003 income tax cuts are all scheduled to expire at the end of December. Uh, so that means, of course, a lot of problems for uh, Congress and the President to solve over the next few weeks. Um, in the meantime, discretionary programs, that is the, the, the federal government's programs that are subject to annual appropriations, and those include nearly all of the federal research and development and STEM education programs, those are temporarily running at last year's levels, at 2012 levels, uh, through March 27, 2013. So the 2013 budget proposals that I'm going to be talking about uh, are still that. They are proposals, and we are waiting for final congressional action to determine what the, the actual priorities for 2013 are going to be. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the federal agencies are operating at last year's levels and are continuing to execute uh, the prior research priorities from the, the previous years. And so we are uh, uh, anticipating that after the, the lame duck session and after sequestration is solved, that then we will have time to look at what the final shape of these 2013 appropriations are going to be. And uh, of course, we hope that uh, as as much as possible, the president's priorities will be included in those 2013 appropriations. Uh, so just a little uh, portrait of what the, of the investments that we're talking about. Within the overall federal budget, the investments in research and development are a small but significant part of that total. And as you can see from the, the pie charts that I pulled out, the pie slices, uh, the federal research and development investment is about $140 billion, or one out of every 20 federal dollars. Uh, and so it is evenly split between defense and non-defense. And we are looking, of course, carefully to build proposals that will uh, sustain the federal government's commitment to cutting-edge science, technology, and engineering. Uh, so to zoom in a little bit on that, we are also looking to uh, in particular at the research, the R part of the R&D budget. So in putting together that investment, which is a little bit in excess of $60 billion, then we are looking at a number of agencies, as you can see from the various colors on the chart. And as you can see, um, you'll be hearing from many of these agencies and my agency colleagues uh, as we talk about uh, what's in the, the research pr proposals for uh, the science agencies and the federal government. The 2013 budget, as you can see, does propose uh, an increase in federal research funding for, uh, despite some very tough economic conditions. So we are, of course, waiting for uh, the congressional appropriations that we hope will sustain this increase that the president has proposed. So let me take some time to look at uh, the futures of this federal research investment and where this investment is likely to go. So as I indicated earlier, one of the themes of the federal budget for 2013 is to push the frontiers of scientific discovery. Uh, so the 2013 budget does sustain the president's commitment, which he first articulated in 2009, to double the budgets of three key science agencies, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy's Office of Science, and the laboratories at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, so of course, you'll be hearing from those agencies as we go along. Uh, also, within the science area, the 2013 budget does support a strong NASA science portfolio. Uh, now, to illustrate, so here uh, are those three key agencies that I talked about. 
uh, they are on a long-term doubling path. And uh, the path is not as originally outlined in 2009 because of many of the deficit reduction talks that have taken place over the, over the last few years. But as you can see, we are still hopeful uh, and the President has proposed increases for these three agencies to keep them on a, a, a long-term doubling path. Uh, and you'll be hearing uh, later on about some of the specific investments and research opportunities that are contained in the budgets of these three agencies. Within some of the other research agencies, uh, there are some proposals as well. Uh, we are also looking to, uh, to invest $31 billion in 2013 for the National Institutes of Health. Obviously, that is the, the largest funding source for basic and applied research in the federal government. And that, of course, supports a great deal of the university-based research uh, enterprise here in the United States. Uh, in addition, you know, we have some uh, funding for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, which is a particularly important source of support for the nation's land-grant universities, uh, including $325 million proposed for the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, the AFRI, program is the USDA's competitive extramural grants program. So this funding will be awarded competitively to proposals from, uh, we anticipate, from the nation's land-grant universities and other universities that are interested in pursuing basic agricultural research. Also within the federal budget, we have close to $18 million for NASA to drive advances in science, technology, and exploration and uh, $2.6 billion for the Department of Commerce's research and development investments, uh, including investments in NIST and uh, also in NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which does, of course, a lot of uh, atmospheric research and uh, weather research, which has been very important to us over the past week. Uh, also important within this overall investment is the defense research and development investment. Um, as as I showed earlier, uh, defense R&D is, is a little bit more than half of the overall federal R&D portfolio. Most of it is focused on the development side, but there are some very key investments on the research side uh, which affect the nation's colleges and university. Uh, so I'm showing a couple of these key areas right here. So DOD's basic research, or 6-1 accounts, uh, is about $2 billion, and that uh, is a, a an investment that we've worked very hard to sustain, uh, even at a time when the overall defense budget is declining, because of course, these DOD basic research investments do drive the next generation uh, technologies that the military will need. They are also an important source of support for the nation's universities, particularly in the physical sciences, computer science, and engineering. Uh, so DOD basic research is the third largest funding source for the nation's colleges and universities, and so we are working to sustain those investments. In addition, uh, DOD has some applied research investments, a portion of which are, are, are invested in universities. And uh, in the security area, Department of Homeland Security and Department of Energy's weapons activities are also very important. So the administration has been trying to, to focus these investments on a key on a number of key areas, including, as you can see here, advanced manufacturing, energy efficiency, cybersecurity, robotics, clean energy, a safe and secure nuclear arsenal, explosives detection, and biodefense. So we are uh, we are hopeful that, of course, in the 2013 budget and appropriations, that some of these administration priorities will be sustained uh, and that uh, university researchers will be able to continue participating in some of these key research ideas. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about one of the, the relatively new uh, priority areas within the, the federal research portfolio, and that is advanced manufacturing. Uh, so the vision, uh, obviously, is to create and sustain new American jobs in manufacturing. Uh, what we have seen over the past several years is within this economic recovery, for the first time in decades, uh, an increase in American manufacturing jobs. Uh, so clearly these, uh, these jobs are, are real, uh, but they are different from the manufacturing jobs of the past in that they rely on highly skilled, high value added manufacturing rather than, than low, low wage assembly line manufacturing. So in order to sustain this uh, renaissance in American manufacturing, 
Uh, the president asked his Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAST, to uh, recommend ways in which the federal government could invest in uh, American manufacturing. And the PCAST issued a report in last year, last summer, that called for investments in advanced manufacturing research and development. That is a program of federal basic research and applied research that would invest in the knowledge needed to sustain this American renaissance in manufacturing. And also some policy measures to design to strengthen the connections between federally funded research and uh, American companies. So this 2013 budget provides $2.2 billion, um, predominantly new proposals for advanced manufacturing research and development in a number of federal agencies. Uh, and the, within that, uh, the PCAST recommended a couple of focus areas in which the federal investment could really play a big difference. And those are robotics and materials. So within the Advanced Manufacturing Initiative, we also have the National Robotics Initiative and the Materials Genome Initiative. So uh, we are hopeful, of course, that university investigators in manufacturing technologies generally, but particularly materials and robotics, will be able to participate in these federal research efforts. And many of these investments are being matched by the private sector uh, because, of course, manufacturing research is, is all well and good, but in order for it to have economic value, then these insights do have to be carried out by American manufacturing firms. And in order to do that, the PCAST has recommended and the President has set up an advanced manufacturing partnership. The AMP has been bringing together manufacturers, universities, and federal science agencies to keep this federal effort coordinated. Another area in which uh, the administration has been trying to focus resources is, of course, on energy. And the president in uh, the State of the Union address for January articulated a vision for an all-of-the-above uh, American-made energy strategy. And in order to fulfill that, the 2013 budget does contain a number of key investments for clean American energy. Uh, we are continuing to propose uh, a fairly aggressive program within Department of Energy's uh, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Program. Uh, you will see that there's a $2.3 billion proposal for clean energy and focused on a couple of key areas. One is to increase the number of advanced technology vehicles on the road. Two is to increase the productivity, uh, the energy productivity of American industries. And third is to develop new materials for energy efficiency. We're also continuing to support some, a new breakthrough approach for transformational energy research, and that's the DOE's ARPA-E, which was founded in nine, 2009 uh, to bring the DARPA model of high-risk but high-reward research to energy research. So we are, uh, of course, optimistic about, uh, the, the, and we are actually very pleased with some of the results of the initial ARPA-E grants, and we hope to sustain that in the 2013 budget. Within uh, fossil energy, of course, uh, there are many types of fossil energy, but natural gas shows some promise as being a cleaner source of fossil energy than, than oil and coal. And uh, clearly, there's been uh, quite a resurgence in natural gas production in the United States over the last few years. In order to understand better some of the environmental impacts of, of fracking, fracking uh, the administration is proposing uh, a new research initiative on hydraulic fracturing, which will be a partnership between the Department of Energy, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, so we are, we are hopeful that the initial announcements, the initial re research proposals will be, a, will be on the street fairly soon. And all of these investments are part of a $6.7 billion uh, basic research to development to deployment comprehensive clean energy initiative. And so we are uh, waiting uh, for Congress to, to consider these uh, proposals and to enact them in appropriations. Another key part of energy use is, of course, the impacts on the environment. So it's been a, a strong administration priority to revitalize the U.S. Global Change Research Program. As you can see from the chart, over the past few years, we have managed to uh, increase support for this USGCRP. And from the various colors, you, you will see that multiple, you know, 13 federal agencies are involved in this interagency research effort. 
Uh, and for 2013 budget, again, despite some uh, tough budgetary conditions, there is a proposal to increase funding for the USGCRP. So global change research, um, uh, so the administration does re re reaffirm its commitment to addressing the climate change challenge. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we have to improve our understanding of what's happening to the climate and also to understand better our mitigation options, our adaptation op options. And we have to improve our, our methods for delivering climate relevant information to decision makers and to actually to, to the public. So the $2.6 billion for investment for the USG CRP is an increase of $136 million over the 2012 enacted level. Uh, 2013 is going to be actually a, a key year for the climate change research program because it is the year when the next national climate assessment is going to be released. The, the national climate assessment is a congressionally mandated inventory analysis of the state of uh, the climate. Uh, and that is uh, being run out of a, a, a quite a, a volunteer team of federal agency officials, local scientists, and uh, local environmental managers. And so the draft national climate assessment should be released at the end of this, this year. And then over the next year, we'll be accepting public comments and ed editing that into a final national climate assessment report. And these uh, climate assessments, as well as the overall research program, are being guided by a new U.S. GCRP strategic plan, which was released in March. So we are, of course, uh, hopeful that the American research community, particularly university research community, will continue to participate in these research and assessment efforts as they go on in the 2013 budget. And so for, uh, let me conclude with a, a little bit about the, the STEM education portfolio. You will be hearing some more about this from uh, the, the next few speakers, uh, but I just want to, to highlight some of the vision for the STEM education uh, proposals. So this is clearly uh, for the, the president and the administration a high priority. He's called the, this an all hands on deck approach to science, math, technology, and engineering. This is a, an important national priority. Uh, and in particular, uh, the, the focus for where the federal government might be able to make a difference, as you can see, is in helping to train more teachers uh, to encourage more students to sub study these STEM subjects and uh, to make sure that these, uh, these fields are regarded as important. So overall, the federal government is proposing $3.0 billion for federal STEM education programs in the 2013 budget. And these are just the, the programs that are dedicated specifically for STEM education. And of course, within the overall federal education budget, which is far larger than $3 billion, there are additional funds to, to encourage general education. So within that $3.0 billion, consistent with the president's priorities, there are some uh, uh, particular areas of focus. One is, as the president has announced, to prepare 100,000 new STEM teachers over a decade. And that will be a collaborative venture between the Department of Education and the National Science Foundation in the 2013 budget. Also, NSF and education will be collaborating on a joint mathematics education initiative. And that is uh, based on a finding from the president's PCAST that one of the key opportunities for uh, encouraging more uh, American students to stay in STEM sub subjects is to, to address what uh, the PCAST called the math gap that uh, preparation in math subjects is essential for uh, American students to succeed uh, in STEM subjects. But too many uh, students are, are entering college not uh, prepared as they should be in some of these math, uh, math skills. And therefore, they, they uh, face some additional barriers to uh, making it to higher levels of education. Uh, that is part of another area that PCAST diagnosed as in worthy of federal attention, and that is to transform undergraduate STEM education. That uh, one of the, the issues that the United States faces <coughs> is that many American students enter college wanting to major in math, science, and STEM subjects, but we lose, uh, we lose significant portions of students along the way. Uh, so there's something, there are opportunities in the undergraduate years to, in, to improve STEM education, to retain 
uh, more students and to make sure that they have the skills and that they're able to succeed in the majors that they set out wanting to try. And um, let me skip then to kind of the closing vision statement. So within the, the State of the Union address, once again, uh, uh, the administration's vision for the research and development investment and the STEM uh, investment are articulated. And you can see it's about education, it's about uh, manufacturing in highly skilled, high paying jobs. Uh, it's about energy, clean American energy. And of course, it is about an economy that is built to last in which you know, we, the federal government can help to provide the foundation for future economic competitiveness and growth. Uh, so let me close here with uh, just a, a little discussion about OSGP and what we do before handing off to uh, you for questions and also to my agency colleagues who will be talking about uh, what uh, their agencies are doing as part of this overall vision. Uh, so at, at OSGP, uh, we try to provide science and technology advice to the president and other White House offices. We try to lead federal science and technology policy making. Uh, and as you can see from my discussion, we, we coordinate interagency science and technology efforts and R&D spending. And we consult with non-federal stakeholders on science and technology matters. Uh, so in order to do that, much of the coordination work that we do takes place through our National Science and Technology Council. Uh, many of, the co of my colleagues uh, and I participate in NSTC groups, and that is the forum in which we try to bring together the many federal agencies you've heard about who are collaborating on key areas such as advanced manufacturing or climate change. And we try to make sure that uh, these disparate federal agency efforts are kept uh, coordinated. We also support the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So we are, are responsible for, for collecting the advice of these 20 academic and industrial scientists and engineers who work outside the federal government but convene periodically to, to give the President insights about uh, leading edge science and technology. Uh, and as all of that, we, we are you know, working to make sure that the federal investment in science and engineering remains strong. Uh, we are you know, working with uh, Congress to ensure that the, the sequestration issue is solved over the next few weeks so that we can turn to finalizing some of these 2013 budget proposals that are still before us today. So uh, I thank you for, my, uh, for this opportunity to talk to you about some of these proposals. And uh, we hope, uh, of course, we had hoped by now that uh, here in October that many of these proposals would already be uh, enacted into law. The timing is not quite right, but uh, these are the proposals that are still on the table, and we are hopeful that eventually these are the directions that the 2013 Federal Research and Development Investment will be going in. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to uh, keep talking and to answer some of the questions you may have. Thank you, Kay. We appreciate that presentation. I'm going to turn it over to our audience now. If you have a question that you would like Kay to answer, please send an email to federalupdate at missouri.edu. And the questions will be um, sent to us here in Washington, D.C., and we'll pass them along. So if you have a question, please, again, send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. And I'm going to go ahead. I've got one question here. Mm -hmm. um, who leads the Global Change Research Program? Okay. Well, the U.S. Global Change Research Program is uh, managed actually through the OSGP. So some of my colleagues are, are um, leading the NSTC Subcommittee on Global Change Research, which is the, the 13 federal agencies in OSGP brought together uh, to, to integrate these 13 agency efforts. Uh, and to help us, we do have a national coordination office for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which is actually a few blocks from here. Um, and so they uh, help OSTP and the federal agencies by doing the strategic planning and managing the national climate assessment and you know, doing some of the, the interagency stitching together. Uh, so it's actually quite an army of people who are, are leading the U.S. Global Change Research Program, but primarily it is the 13 federal agencies involved uh, who 
make the research investments and then you know bring together their federal agency colleagues to make sure that everything that that they are doing fits in with uh, the rest of the federal government's efforts. Okay, and does that group ever release its own extramural grant solicitations or does everything get released by the sort of regular federal Everything agencies? does get released by the agency. So you, you will find global change research grants coming, uh, proposals from the National Science Foundation, from NASA, Department of Energy, uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, etc. So uh, there's unfortunately not a central source for all the global change research pro uh, program uh, solicitations, but they are dispersed throughout those uh, th dozen different federal agencies. Okay. Another question. Earlier you were talking about uh, the development of new materials and programs. Mm -hmm. um, what agencies will be key in developing those new materials? Uh, so for the Materials Genome Initiative, which I talked about as part of the advanced manufacturing discussion, um, it's primarily those agencies that you see in the advanced manufacturing research and development. For Materials Genome, Department of Energy's Basic Energy Sciences Program, uh, Department of Defense's uh, Basic Research Programs, National Science Foundation's uh, uh, Engineering and uh, Physical Sciences Directorates, um, also the, the laboratories at NIST. Uh, those will be the primary partners in those are the primary partners in putting together these material genome initiative uh, announcements. And uh, a good place to find some of these uh, agency efforts is actually on our website, ostp.gov. Uh, we had an event a few months ago uh, really launching the materials genome initiative, and that has a, a fairly useful summary of what each agency is doing within the MGI. So for a researcher, you may find that uh, maybe the Department of Energy's uh, uh, priorities are close, more closely aligned with what uh, you would want to do. Or, and for some other researchers, it may be the NSF solicitations that are more relevant to, to your work. Okay, again, if you have a question, please feel free to send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, I have a question here. Um, okay. It seems like we've seen a lot of increase in partnering with industry and uh, partnering with small businesses mm -hmm. in, in research. Um, is that expected to grow or continue to be a priority? Uh, yes. It, I th part, it's all about partnerships um, because of, of course, the limited resources that we are all facing. And, so, and we really do need to partner in order to accomplish things. And you've seen that on the federal government side with uh, efforts like the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. Um, and uh, other public-private partnerships in STEM education. For example, we've launched the Educate to Innovate Partnership and also a, a new organization called Change the Equation. So those are all uh, partnerships that are bring together the public and private sectors. Um, and it's not just driven by fis the fiscal conditions. It's also driven by, um, as, as you can see from the advanced manufacturing area, the recognition that we can do better at linking federally funded research that's performed primarily in universities to the private sector who will ultimately adopt these technologies and you know enter them into the, com the commercial marketplace. So that uh, those are really the two drivers behind the, this clear push to encourage uh, the public sector and the private sector to work together. Okay, another question. Um, we have uh, quite a few representatives from the small liberal arts college mm -hmm. community and community colleges with yes. us today. Um, and they're wondering if you could talk about any of the goals the White House might have in terms of partnering with these types of institutions uh, to promote scientific discovery and job development. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the, what, as, as you may have heard, the uh, administration has uh, launched uh, a, f a fairly broad scale uh, initiative targeting community colleges because clearly that is the, an area in which uh, millions of Americans are receiving their higher education and we want to in encourage that. Um, and so, in fact, there's a, a $2 billion effort separate from the things I've been talking about that is targeted at community colleges to in improve access to improve learning of, of key science and mathematics courses within, within community colleges. And so we 
we think that, that that will be we think that'll be a high impact area, uh, and so we are hopeful that that's going to continue. Um, and the Department of Education, you may you want to talk to late, a little bit later on about how they are contributing to the community college initiative. Okay. Again, if you have any questions, um, please send your emails to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Just a, a general mm -hmm. question, um, okay. not considering sequestration and whatever effect that might have. Um, do you see any barriers to implementing the recommendations in your presentations? Um, hmm. Well, let's see. It'd be a political question, I know. <laughs> uh, well, there will be, there are always issues. Uh, so we are um, in, uh, implementing a new federal uh, initiatives it's always a problem, um, all, and that's, but of course that's why we have you know, so many talented agency colleagues and, uh, and OSTP colleagues pitching in to make sure that whatever barriers we encounter uh, are, can be solved. So that's certainly been key with, for example, the advanced manufacturing effort in which uh, we, in, to implement this fairly expansive vision that uh, President received from PCAST and that he articulated, we have spent a lot of time working with uh, agency colleagues to set up a national program office to design the solicitations um, and to build proposals that then you know go out on the street. So that there's a lot of work involved, and there's of course a lot of behind the scenes work to make sure that uh, some of those uh, resources actually get uh, invested in laboratories. So it's a lot of problem solving, but of course we are confident that if disaster does not strike uh, in the form of sequestration that we'll be able to to go forward with uh, new research solicitations and of course continuing support for the ongoing research projects that the university community has been involved in. Okay, any last questions out there please feel free to send an email to mm -hmm. federalupdate at missouri.edu. Okay. Um, Kay, are you willing to answer questions if people have some oh, yes. that come up later? Mm -hmm. They can go ahead and, mm -hmm. and email you. I believe your email uh -huh. is at the end of your presentation. Yes, it is. Uh, so please feel free to, uh, there it is. That, yes. So okay. I'm here and um, look forward to, to hearing from the community uh, because I haven't been able to hear from any of you directly right now. So. I, I trust you are out there, uh, but thank you for the chance to talk to you today. And thank you so mm -hmm. much for coming in, uh, being so flexible mm -hmm. and able to reschedule so quickly. We really appreciate it. Um, that was Kay Kozumi, and um, thank you again for coming.